You're live. Yay. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> 2022 is off to a great start. <laughs> you can always trust your computers. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> Watch the movie iRobot sometime. Anyway, it's a great new year, and we've got uh, one more Sunday of Christmas, though, for all you liturgical fans. Yeah, Epiphany comes up on January 6th, so Christmas, we're still in the 12 days of Christmas, so I thought, why not? Let's do a Christmas sermon today, and I think you're going to enjoy it, because it gets us into living Christmas, the gifts of Christmas, all year around. Isn't that what we say? Yeah. Christmas every day, right? So we're going to talk about that this morning a little bit. Uh, also, we've got our missions treasure chest open. Uh, we're ending up, I forgot to announce last Sunday, but uh, <laughs> for the next couple of Sundays today and a couple more Sundays because we operate by grace. This is for fourth quarter last year missions. It goes to the Salvation Army up in the Sioux, Sioux St. Marie. Uh, they do a wonderful job up there reaching out to people and and helping the community out, and so we wanted to support them. So this is for Salvation Army, yay, and uh, we'll be collecting today, but if you didn't bring your checkbook, wallet, or gold, gold bullion with you this morning, <laughs> you uh, still have a couple more Sundays, so you can do that. Uh, also, just uh, Tuesday morning, we're, we're going strong, and we're reading Word for Today, doing the devotional there to kick off some really cool discussion. So you are invited if you're on the island, come join us Tuesday morning at 10 or Wednesday morning. You can join us on uh, Google, uh, the online meet, Google meet. Uh, we do a Bible study. We're on Mark chapter three and working our way through the earliest gospel. Everything is action packed. Mark is that action packed gospel and we're enjoying that. Uh, there's so much content there and uh, getting to see the real Jesus, it's so exciting. So you can join us there. You do need to email the church to show your interest, and then we email you back a link. And all you have to do is, is tap on that link. There's no passwords or you know hoops to jump through. It's real simple, easy peasy. So you can join us for that. Um, I think that's about it. Let's start with a prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, again, for Christmas. We thank you for being born, for becoming flesh and dwelling among us. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you dwell among us today, that you indicated how God operates and has always operated throughout all of eternity. And we thank you, Lord, that you are close to us, that we can have a close and intimate relationship with you, who is the source of life. We bless you. We thank you, Lord. Open our hearts open our minds, open our eyes this morning to see some, a new aspect of who you are in our lives that we may enter into that new step, that new beginning that you have for us in this new year. We bless you and thank you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Let's sing a song. Let's do a Christmas song, Ruth. Venite adoremus Domenu, 
Venite adoremus Domenum, venite adoremus Domenum. St. Joseph too was my to tend the child, to guard him and protect his mother mild. The angels hovered round and sang this song, venite adoremus. Catholics? No. Latin scholars? Yeah. Venite has come. Let us come and adore. And dominum is where we get our word dominate. But God doesn't do that, right? Not in human terms. But dominum means Lord, the master, the one who's in charge. Come, let us adore the Lord as the snow lays on the ground. We've got a little bit of it. That was a new one for me. I don't know if that's a new song for some of yeah, you. Yeah, but... how many was that new for? You need to out of it. Most of us. Okay. Wow, you guys. You guys need to get out more. Just saying. <laughs> if you can go online, um, the Tabernacle Choir, Salt Lake, uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir has a beautiful rendition of it. Sort of how right. I became familiar with it. Plus that. All right. <clears throat> I think you might recognize this one. <clears throat> Not too much Latin. <laughs> Thank you. 
song in this time of discordant and not resonant kinds of sounds that we hear in the world today. Help us, Lord, to be your harmony, to harmonize with your song that you are singing through the angels, through Jesus, through all of creation. Help us to harmonize with your song, Lord Jesus Christ, in all the earth, in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to have communion, but it's going to be following the message. So those of you who are watching on Facebook, if you want to get some bread together or crackers, some grape juice, wine, or whatever you have, and uh, get ready for communion, because that will be kind of the culmination of the message this morning. As I mentioned, this is a Christmas sermon, so what better way to talk about, when you think of Christmas, to talk about Christmas gift, Christmas gifts all around the tree and all this, but there was a special Christmas gift that was given, maybe you read it in, in the news a few days ago, uh, a Christmas gift was given by Santander Bank, uh, it's a European bank, and this article that I read came out of the UK. Santander Bank on Christmas morning issued, I want to make sure I get the number right, issued a very special Christmas gift to 75,000 of their customers. It was a Christmas gift of over $176 million U.S. dollars, and uh, people were quite surprised by that. The article said that uh, paychecks, People got double their paychecks, and, and uh, banks got this much, and businesses received double, and this and that. And uh, the article ended with that they are, at this point, still trying to recover the money. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> but uh, $176 million, and some people got real excited very quickly on Christmas morning. But we know that Christmas really isn't about that, is it? It's not about the money. It's really not about the physical gifts. It's about the gifts that are in the heart. It's about family getting together. It's about 
that love connection that happens at Christmas, the songs, the, the combination of what goes on at Christmas and the excitement that people feel as they make that connection with what life is really all about and the birth of Jesus, which gives us such an amazing opportunity for new beginnings. But this morning I'd like to explore Christmas and I'd like to explore the real gifts of Christmas. But from the alternative Christmas story this morning, from the Christmas story that is told to us by the Gospel of John, it's not your typical Christmas story. It doesn't have angels, doesn't have shepherds. In fact, it doesn't really even kind of start on planet Earth. <laughs> it starts way back at the beginning of creation. But it's a special Christmas story, and I believe it's got some special gifts for us this morning. So if you turn with me to John chapter 1, we're going to read the first part of John and read what John has for us as a Christmas story. This will be the first 17 verses, John 1, 1 through 17. And you'll recognize some of this. And this morning I'd like to look at seven Christmas gifts that are there for us from the Christmas story of John. Seven Christmas gifts that we can not only carry with us throughout every day of the year, but we can let that particular giftedness of Jesus Christ of God himself, begin to soak us and dwell within us in a new way for 2022. So John starts out this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, Nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every person. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now John testified about him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. I see seven gifts in here, seven gifts, seven takeaways that we can take this Christmas and live out the other 364 days of the year. But before we get to those gifts, I'd like to talk about the nature of those gifts. Because I think those gifts, what came to mind when I was praying about this, is that those gifts are kind of like an artist's canvas, an artist's canvas that an artist will paint upon. And canvas paper comes in many different forms, and I brought one of my watercolor pads here this morning. This is a, it's a medium weight watercolor paper, and a canvas is, is like a background, okay? But it profoundly affects the picture that is being painted, or inked in, or pastelled in, or whatever medium that you are using the background, the paper, the canvas, 
profoundly affects that. How smooth it is or how rough it is, how absorbent it is, how it absorbs the paint or the ink, or how non-absorbent it is, getting more crisp lines and less bleeding. The background profoundly perfect, uh, affects the, the picture itself. So the picture, to kind of move this into the metaphor stage, the picture that you have of life every day, when your feet hit the ground in the morning, the picture you have, the attitude you have, the filters that you have in place, everything, all that, the, the whole painting that you construct for yourself is profoundly affected by the canvas upon which it is printed. And so these gifts, I'm suggesting these seven gifts are like a canvas. They're like a background. And so whatever reality is being painted in your life, the background profoundly affects it. And all seven of these gifts will affect the picture that you have of God, people, life, whatever, your calling, your purpose, who you are, all of that stuff is profoundly affected by this background. Subtle, to be sure. I mean, it's, it's background, right? But it profoundly affects the brush strokes of what you call your reality. Okay, I know this is getting a little cosmic, but hey, we're reading John, <laughs> so why not? In the beginning was the word. So let's take a look at the seven gifts that you can carry with you that it's more like, it's not so much caring with, it's more like being awakened. It's more like waking up or having your eyes open to the qualities of your particular canvas, the canvas of your life, the background. How is God painting and what kind of background is that? So the first one, the first gift, I think, that John gives us as a Christmas gift is the idea of communication. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, the word was with God and was God. And the idea of word here, it's the Greek word logos, you know, which we've talked about before, and it doesn't just simply mean word, like a single word. It, it can mean a sentence, it can mean a paragraph, it can mean a whole narrative. It can mean a whole structured kind of narrative about a particular subject. Well, in this case, Jesus as the word is the entire complete narrative about God. Complete. Michael Card has a wonderful song called The Final Word. It's a great Christmas song. And it's about Jesus as the final word. Jesus, there's lots of words about God, and God speaks through the prophets and all this throughout history. But there comes that final word, who is Jesus Christ. And he is born in that manger. And the word begins, the narrative of who God is. The final word, the final, and it ends with the resurrection. But wait, it doesn't really end there, does it? It ends or continues with us, continues with the church, and continues with those who choose to follow him and move with him and be in harmony with the angel's song. So the word of God, God communicates with us, all of us, all the time. There's that constant broadcast that's going on that God is broadcasting to us about who we are, what we're about, what we need to be about in our lives. This constant communication being broadcasted through the loving whisper of Jesus Christ as the word of God. And so part of this is learning to be awakened to that communication. And God will speak in unusual ways and through unusual kinds of media. Uh, little kids and dogs and Hallmark cards and, and funny movies and once in a while a pastor or, or you know, a friend or a family member or that person that you really don't care for or you know, just all sorts of unusual and surprising places. The word of God will pop up for us and will say something profound. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? And this is a challenge to all of us because we're used to seeing God, you know, pop up in our little rectangle, <laughs> our little field of vision. And God 
pops up over here in left field or right field or wherever. You go, whoa, is that you, Jesus? And the marks are there. The distinguishing marks are there. We go, wow, you are tricky. <laughs> That's pretty good. But he loves to surprise us. Our ego will want to build little frameworks to contain him. And Jesus goes, well, I don't live in your tents. <laughs> I live outside of that stuff. Let me show you where I live. And he'll, he'll come through some unusual places. Are we willing to hear the prophetic message of the word in our lives? And to the extent that you are able to hear that word and act upon it, not just hear. Remember, Jesus talked about this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. You don't just hear it, but those who act upon it are like people whose lives are built on solid rock. And people will notice that about you. People will notice that, that you go through stuff just like anybody else. You go through junk in your life, and people go, but there's something, a different quality about that person, about you. And maybe they'll ask. And maybe they'll say, what is it about you? And you can tell your story. So, the Word of God. God's constant communication. He doesn't withdraw. He doesn't you know, stay away just because you're in a bad mood or you're, you're disconnected. The broadcast does not stop just because you're disconnecting still continues because God is faithful even when we are unfaithful, the Bible says. So listen for the broadcast, but in unusual and surprising places. So that's gift number one, to learn to grow in that and, and be a witness there. The second one is creation, that nothing was made that is made. It was, nothing's been made without him. The word of God spoke into being, or we like to think of was sung into being, the song of God, sang all of creation, the joy that was there in the song of God at the beginning of creation. And God sings it into being. And it's not just a one-time event, it's, it's part of the nature of who God is. God is creative to the very last little bit of presence of God, that God's creativity constantly flows, always. And it's, it's always such a wonder to see artists at work, you know, doing their craft, uh, watercolors or, or uh, doing pottery or whatever they're doing, uh, sculpting to, to show the beauty and the creativity of God. And then we've got sunsets and wonderful things like that. The sun glistening off the snow and all the little diamonds in there. I mean, it's just God's creativity is so, so amazing but that lives in you too. And you go, well, I don't have a creative bone in my body. Oh, yes, you do. There's a, there are places of creativity in every one of our lives. I don't care who you are, but you're creative in some way. And it's to find that creativity and to move with that. Or God may bring you opportunities to be creative in new ways. You go, well, I can't do that. And God goes, oh, yes, you can. And something new pops up. And you, are you willing to step into that creative place that God has given to you? Watch for God's creativity. Because anything that is created that has beauty in it or is wonderful or, or in any way that has lasting kinds of stuff to it, its source is God. Anything that's creative, you can construct things and build things and create things, but at the very center of it is that the Spirit of God moving through you, and you go, whoa, really? I thought I was just building a birdhouse, you know? But the Spirit of God is moving through you at its source. I guess part of this is thankfulness, too, is to be grateful for the gifts that, that God does flow through us and give to us. So creativity, creation, God working through all of creation, and he's working now. The third thing is victory. Because we change metaphors, we change from word to light, and we've got the light shining in the darkness, and darkness here would be the world powers that would try to snuff out the creativity of God, the joy of Jesus Christ, the, the love of God. Darkness would be the powers of this world, not only 
individuals, but even really more pointedly, the, the political, religious, uh, whatever, economic, whatever kinds of systemic kinds of powers that would try to move in and suffocate, suffocate the joy and the love of God. But the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot, and, and I don't know what you have in your Bible, but it's, it's a wonderful Greek, Greek word, katalambano, uh, that, that means that it, it, it can't hold on tightly to it. It can't grasp it in a, in a kind of seizing, it can't seize it in a, in a way to either control it or handle it or even understand it. It can't, I guess grasp is a good word because it can't grasp it either in its mind. I don't get it. I don't understand it, but it also can't grasp it in order to control it or take it down. There's a victory there for us. There's a victory in the light of Jesus Christ. There's a victory for us. When you walk into a room, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're moving with, with his Christmas gifts inside of you, you walk into a room unconscious, you know, you're not necessarily singing a hymn or praying a prayer. You walk into a room, you are a powerful light in that room. The darkness flees, has to flee. The darkness has to go. You are a lighthouse, maybe, without knowing it. Try to know that. <laughs> when you walk into a place, there's light shining out of you. Jesus Christ is going out and touching people all over the place, whether you're aware of it or not. Remember, part of this is awakening, just waking up to some of the dynamics of the stuff that's going on. Demons are falling. Darkness is scattering. The gates of hell are not prevailing against you. And this is exciting stuff, that you walk in a victory that is a gift, a Christmas gift. Thank you, John. The darkness can't comprehend it, it can't grasp it, it can't grab a hold of its collar, shake it up. It has to flee. The gates are flung open, and we go right into the darkness. And just like one candle inside of a dark cave, it just lights it all up. One candle. You can be that candle. You are that candle. You are. Fourth thing is the idea of enlightenment or truth. Truth as a light that enlightens every person. Oh, not just any light, a true light. A true light that enlightens every person. You have the image of God within you, you got the candle. I don't see it. Lift the basket up. <laughs> Pull it off. You've got the candle of Christ, not because you deserve it, not because you're such a spiritual Christian, not just because you come to church or love your pastor or whatever, maybe you love your pastor, but it's just a, you've got the candle inside of you, you've got the light inside of you that shines, shines out and enlightens every person. And it's that light of Christ, it's that true light that reveals all the stuff. And we go, ooh, I don't know if I want everything revealed. That's one of the signs of a true follower of Christ is we have a commitment to the truth, a commitment to that light because that light at the same time is a bright and intense light. It's a laser light that will burn away all of the ego stuff and all of the resistance stuff and all of the self-centeredness and all of that stuff that keeps us from connecting with God, connecting with others, connecting with creation all that stuff inside of us that keeps us, that resists God, we've all got it. And for us as, who have committed our lives to the light, the word of Christ, we commit ourselves to that laser light to burn away. We go, yeah, do the surgery. Do it, God. Oh, it hurts a bit, you know. But what freedom, what liberation. The light that enlightens every person. There's, I, I remember going to a Keith Green concert back, the late Keith Green, who was a Christian singer, a prophetic voice. I mean, listen to some of his songs sometime. And there's, there's a song that he has that's called Asleep in the Light. And there's this, there's this line in the song that says, the world 
The world is sleeping in the dark that the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the light. The world is sleeping in the dark that the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the light. Keith Green's songs are all about waking up, waking up to the glory, the gift, the wonder of the Spirit of God all around us and living into that powerfully, living into that powerfully in truth. The fifth one is an acknowledgement of closed hearts. That God acknowledged that there are those who don't receive him. But God keeps on operating. He keeps on shining. He keeps on doing his thing. Even though there are those. And, and we all are a mixture of open and closed hearts. I mean, and God recognizes that, that too. And John puts it in a way of welcoming, you know, welcoming, receiving, welcoming the truth, welcoming the word of God, the light in our lives. And that there are those who we were created by him, we're held together by the very grace of God, the presence of God, but we don't get it. And, and not only do we not get it, but we kind of close the little gates of our hearts. And we go, oh, I don't know, I, I'm going to be protective because we get hurt or things happen in our lives and we, we don't trust anymore and we close that gate, but we're closing it to God too and others that we love and, and we're locking ourselves inside of our own prison. But God keeps on operating. <laughs> he keeps on loving us, keeps on wooing us, keeps on drawing us to open that, that little door, that little gate, that little window a little bit more and to learn to grow in him. Closed hearts. It's a fact of life. Parable of the sower. So many different places in Jesus' ministry where Jesus, you know, he demonstrates, he understands, God understands where we are in life. Sometimes we're getting choked by weeds or we're hard ground or whatever we are. And then maybe we're soft ground, a nice rain comes. Um, we're different every day. And God recognizes that. But we always look forward to that time where the seed planted, that word of God is planted in our hearts, and it's good ground. <laughs> and it yields this wonderful fruit. Oh, it's so beautiful. There's rejoicing. There's a party in heaven. When a closed heart opens up, it's like a flower. It's so beautiful. Those who received him, those who do welcome and at least have a little bit of opening in their hearts, those who receive become children of God. You become family. And it's not that we're any better than anybody else because God's family invitation is to everybody. Amen. Never stops. It never stops. And so it's not like we're, we're some little elite group and go, well, we've got something you don't have. No, everybody has it. Jesus gave it as a gift uh, upon the cross. Everybody has this family gift, but not everybody acts upon it. Not everybody realizes it or is awakened to it. And so we become family. And that doesn't mean, it, family doesn't mean if you have the wrong idea about your family, you get kicked out. If your theology is not quite on or whatever goes on or, or in your lifestyle, guess what? You're still family. You're still in for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness and in health. Your, your family, your kids. And so you don't lose your salvation like car keys, you know. You don't have to worry about stuff like that. That God's already provided that you are part of God's family. And that is so cool to know that you're not operating alone. That it, not only is God with you, but the Trinity is with you. But whoa, wait a minute, all of the church is with you. But you're more connected than you ever realized because you're part of a big family. It's huge. It's a great family. You never have to operate in life alone. How would your confidence factor change? Whoop, ratchet up. 
if you knew that you had people at your back, you know, holding you up and, and bringing you forward, how would you operate differently if you had that knowledge, that deep knowledge that you are part of a bigger family, much bigger family? And then finally, the seventh gift that you can carry with you. And the word actually means gift. And it's the word grace. Moses brought the law. He brought the rule. Gave us the rule book. But truth and grace from Jesus. A truth that is far more than any rule. Far bigger. It's a relational kind of truth. It's a truth that is that goes way beyond tiny little do's and don'ts. Goes deep, soaks deep into our bones. But the grace, grace, the word itself means gift. It means gift. And this last thing provides really the context. That is the canvas, really, if you're talking about one gift. It's the word grace. It provides, it is the canvas in which we can live our life. But if we accept that canvas, if we fully realize that canvas, it changes everything. The whole painting is changed. The whole kind of structure and, and texture of your reality is changed by grace. Because it means that life essentially is a gift from a good giver. It means that you're living in the energy, the provision of a good giver, giving gifts to you all the time. You come up against a wall and you don't know what to do, you've got a good giver who's going to give you some thoughts in your head, some wisdom on how to do that. You come up against relationships that are really sticky and it's a minefield and all this, but you live with a good giver, a guide, who will take you through that minefield. And not only that, will help you help others through that minefield. You have economic difficulties, you've got a good giver who will give you just enough to get you through that desert area of your life. You've got a good giver who is always giving gifts freely. Oh, but I don't deserve it. Doesn't matter. A good giver continues to give, continues to give you an overflowing amount of gifts that if you're willing to listen to them and receive them, you can live a whole different quality of life. Now, all of this is on a continuum, right? It's all part of our journey, and we're all in different places on that journey. It's neither good or bad, but it's taking a look, and it's awakening to the gifts that God has given you, and particularly these seven Christmas gifts on the canvas of your life, looking at these seven gifts and which one kind of resonates with you? Oh, I'm feeling a spark with this one or something with this one. I think I'm being challenged to live more deeply into number two or three or whatever. Or maybe you have number eight or nine or 10 or some other gift that God has given to you in this new year to live more deeply and more profoundly. What is that gift? Listen to the word of God. Listen to the whisper of the Almighty in your heart this 2022. We're going to have communion now, which is basically an affirmation that life is a gift. You didn't make the grape juice this morning. <laughs> Somebody did, but you didn't. Uh, you didn't make the bread? Well, Sue did. Thank you, Sue. Um, but it, was, it comes as a gift, just like everything that God gives. And the very life that comes through this sacrament, the life of God, is a pure gift to you. Because God loves you so, so very much. And it's learning to live into the gift of that love each and every moment. So let's have communion together. And Ruth is going to play a little bit for us because music always helps things to go deeper, I think. The song of God. But take your bread or your cracker in hand 
And just remember this bread represents, it represents all the provision in your life, the stuff you need, the bread of life. But it's more than just stuff that you eat. It's everything that sustains you, that you don't have to worry about it, that you don't have to worry about all the stuff that's going on because you're part of a bigger family. And so you take the bread of life and, and we confirm and affirm that Jesus is at the very source of all of that. That he is our bread and that it freely gives us that life even when it costs him everything. And so we take that bread into our lives and say thank you. blood of Jesus Christ that is shed for us so freely, so completely. It is a picture of God's continuous pouring out of himself for us. Not just at the cross, which is the pinnacle of Jesus' ministry, but throughout all of eternity. God is always pouring that spirit out, that gift out, that love out, that truth out, that abundance out continually. Fire hydrant spewing it out unto all who care to go under its stream. You know, that's just how he operates. And so the very life that we live is filled and generated by the word of God, by Jesus by God. So this little bit of grape juice, this whether you have wine or grape juice or whatever you're doing, that representing the very lifeblood of God, we say, I want some of that. I want that to be in me. I want to live that way. Take the blood of God. And what we say, Lord, is thank you. We recognize and we come near and we adore your lordship. It is not a dominating kind of human lordship. The domination that you give us is a servanthood. <laughs> That's how you dominate. You take the servant's towel and you wash our feet. Turn our world upside down, Lord Jesus, O word of God. Through the things that you speak, the light that you shed, the bread that you are, turn our world upside down. Help us to carry the gifts that you have planted in our hearts today and help us to begin something new in our lives, something new for 2022. Thank you, Jesus, for all the gifts that you give to us. Help us to operate and unwrap them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you guys on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. And again, if you're on the island, come join us Tuesday morning. Or even if you're off island on Wednesday morning, join us for a little Bible study. Uh, and it's all about Jesus. It's all about growing in that life. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your financial support, your giftedness. If you're able to do a year, oh, I guess it's past the year end. A year beginning gift. <laughs> We'd be appreciative uh, in this winter time. But we love you guys. Pray for us. We pray for you. Keep us uh, appraised of prayer requests. Put your comments down and share this video with someone that you think might need a word of hope in their lives. So God bless you. You have a great week.